John chapter 1 in our text this morning will be verses 29 through 34, but I'll begin reading verse 19. Remember the first 18 verses are that introduction that John writes, and then in verse 19 begins that work of John the Baptist, and so we'll begin there, but read through verse 34. And if you're able to, I ask you would stand for the reading of God's Word. Now this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. And they said to him, Who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize, if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you, whom you do not know. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore a witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The grass withers, the flower fades, the words of God endure and forever. Amen. To be seated. John the writer of the Gospel seems to be spending a lot of time on John the Baptist and his ministry, his preaching, his teaching, his baptizing. And John has this focus because he wants us to see that Jesus, as he is introduced, and as he begins his ministry, that he is the one who has had the way prepared before him. John is the herald. John is the prophet announcing from God that the time is at hand. And we think of how when we hear of announcements, that we are always interested, well, who is saying this? Do we believe them? Is there a credibility? We think of how nations interact with each other and they send an ambassador who has to have credentials, who has to show that, yes, I am sent, I can speak on behalf of a nation. And as Jesus comes, God has prepared the way. The announcement has come from John, who was a prophet, and all recognized that here was a fearless, faithful prophet announcing the coming of Jesus. Why are we so concerned to spend time considering this? John announced Jesus. And we have this same Jesus announced to us. And why do we need to be concerned with who is this Jesus? We need to be concerned for the same reason that those who heard John had to be concerned. 
It is Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. It is Jesus, who is the Son of God. We need to be concerned to have a right understanding of who Jesus is because we are called to trust in Him for the forgiveness of sins. We are called to trust in Him because in Him there is life and outside of Him there is only judgment. Believing in Jesus Christ means you are entrusting yourself to Him to save you for all eternity. Your eternal soul is at stake. And therefore, we don't just say, well, that sounds nice, I'll believe it. And John writes so that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing in Him, you may have forgiveness. We need to know that for ourselves, before we communicate to others. And so we see John's testimony here concerning Jesus, and we read in our text, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him. Now here's a little question for you. When was this? When was this? We, we might think on a casual reading, well this was when John the Baptist baptized Jesus. But the answer is no. That's not what is recorded here. John has, the writer of the Gospel, has not recorded the incident of Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist. No, here Jesus is coming back after his baptism, after he has been driven into the wilderness by the Spirit, after he has been tempted for 40 days and 40 nights by Satan, and now he comes back again. And John sees him coming. Jesus is going to begin his ministry. And John now declares again, the identity of Jesus. And there are two terms used to identify Jesus in our text. One, the Lamb of God. And the other, the Son of God. We want to think about how these give to us an understanding of the person and ministry of Jesus. John sees Jesus and says, Behold, take note, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, what do you think of when you think of a lamb? Children may think of this cute little animal, white and fuzzy, that jumps around a little. But in John's day, there would have been a different understanding of lamb was one that was sacrificed. A lamb was one that was killed. A sign of judgment of God. There is discussion about what reference in the Old Testament there would be. We think of the lamb that every Passover was killed and eaten by family. Going back to Exodus chapter 12, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And that lamb would be killed and eaten. It would be a remembrance when God passed over all the houses that had the blood of that lamb on its doorposts. We think of the daily sacrifice that occurred at the tabernacle, later at the temple. This is the offering made by fire. 
which you shall offer to the Lord, two male lambs in their first year without blemish, day by day, as a regular burnt offering. There again, another image. When we think of how that image continues to be used and developed in the Old Testament so that Isaiah speaks of a lamb as well. As he speaks of the one God would send. Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. You begin to think, here is the context in which John declares the Lamb of God, the one sent by God. But notice how he ties it inextricably to the removal of sin. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This was the image that people had that they would think of. <clears throat> the judgment of God averted, passed over because the Lamb had been slain. The sacrifice day by day, morning and evening, and all because of sin. And yet the sacrifices continued on and on and on. And they could not say, well, all the sin has been taken care of. And here John announces, the Lamb of God who takes away, who takes away sin. This is the great and glorious work of the Messiah, <laughs> of the one who comes, that he will remove sin, that it will be not counted against the people of God anymore. And here, sin is that term that is broad and includes every offense against God and against men. And notice his work. It's not just for a few people, just for the priests, just for Israel. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John already, as he is presenting this gospel, is indicating it is not going to be just for the Jews. This is for the whole world because the whole world is guilty of sin before God. This lamb, this lamb, is not only for the Jews, for Israel, but for all who will come to him. You think, readily of John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It is this land. And the scope of his work is for the whole world, for the whole cosmos. That's a Greek word that is used here. And we think of that when we think of the vastness. And we say the whole cosmos, the whole universe. And here is God's answer for sin. And Jesus is identified as the Lamb of to sacrifice, to satisfy. And John then makes that point. He, he identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God, fulfilling all that he had been declaring about him. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. John is saying, This is the one. All my work, all my preparation. Here is the focus, the highlight of my ministry. This had to be revealed to John. He did not know it. He did not decide it. But it was revealed to him. This is he. And that revelation comes 
to John. That he may now declare, my ministry, he could say, is, is wrapping up. Because mine was a ministry of preparation, and here comes the Lamb of God. Here comes the one who will accomplish the forgiveness of sin. The removal of its guilt. <laughs> washing it away so that we are clean and righteous in the sight of God. Now John declares this about Jesus. For it was revealed to him by the Spirit. And, and yet we know that later on he will still struggle. Because as many in John's day, he, he was expecting that the Messiah would come in triumph. And Jesus came and his ministry was ongoing and John the Baptist ends up in prison and he thinks, where is the coming of the kingdom? He does not understand. And he sends a delegation. Are you the one? Are you the coming one? He, he, he doesn't see that the circumstances for he has not fully grasped that ministry of Jesus as the Lamb of God. Now he declares it. He does not understand that Christ will be sacrificed, dying on the cross to satisfy justice. But here he declares what has been revealed to him because, yes, he identifies him as the Lamb of God, and therefore says, after me comes a man. It was Jesus as a person, as a human being, who could stand in the place of his people. He had our nature, and therefore he could stand, he could substitute for you, for me. But we see as well, verse 34, at the end of our text, his identification as the Son of God. Not through adoption, but rather being the eternal Son of God. And Jesus is identified by the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. For we, we see that John... The Baptist bears witness. How did he know that it was Jesus whom he is declaring, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Think of that. Who would be able to take away the sin of the world? John says, I didn't come up with that idea. I didn't know, but God revealed it to me. I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and remained upon him. And this was what God had said, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And John, we know from the other Gospels, John the Baptist, when Jesus came to be baptized, there was a glorious manifestation of our trying God. The Son incarnate. The Spirit descending upon him as a dove. The voice of the Father saying, Behold, my Son, in whom I am well pleased. A glorious presentation of our trying God. And the Spirit descends, coming upon Jesus. To equip him. We think of the Old Testament, how the Spirit of God would come upon <coughs> men, women, equipping them for the tasks that God had for them. We think of the judges, how the Spirit descended upon them, they get, went forth, calling Israel to fight against their enemies. We think of how the Spirit came upon Saul and led Israel to victory. But we're mindful that the Spirit did not always remain. Saul had the Spirit of God come upon him for a time. 
but he left. And he proved himself to be reprobate. And even those who had the Spirit of God. We think of David, we read about the Spirit of God continued upon him from the time of his anointing. And yet we think the life of David and we think, look at the sin. David's capacity for the Spirit to indwell him was limited. The Spirit comes upon Jesus, the Son of God. And we have in the person of Jesus Christ that capacity that the Spirit has given to him without measure. John will write in John 3, 36. So the Spirit comes and rests upon him and remains upon him. And the capacity the Son of God to be filled with the Spirit is without limit. And this is the one who comes to minister. This is the one of whom John says, Behold, here is God's answer. And he wants people to know. Because here, John is saying, Here's the hope, the only hope, for you, for me, to know the forgiveness of sins, that we might be received by God, and that we may avoid His eternal judgment. And therefore, the Gospel writer John records the words of John, who baptizes that we may have that confidence as well. He testifies that you may know the identity of the one that you are called to trust with your eternal life. To trust for the forgiveness of sin. And this is the great announcement that John made. Jesus is baptized by the Holy Spirit. It comes upon him and remains. And John says, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. We think of baptism as, as that which identifies us with another person. That Israel, going through the Red Sea, they were baptized into Moses, 1 Corinthians 10 tells us. They were identified with him, being led by God. And Jesus, baptized with the Holy Spirit, identifying us with God. With God Himself. That was manifest at Pentecost. The Spirit comes down. There is, as it were, tongues of fire upon each person. But we know that we are all baptized by the Holy Spirit. Identified through that baptism with Jesus Christ. That we were in baptism, buried with him and raised with him. This is the identification. And it's Jesus who is the power, the right, to baptize with the Holy Spirit. To give that new identity. To give that cleansing. To say, you are mine. Not even merely as a servant, but as a brother, as a sister, as a child of God. Remember, we had read that in the introduction, that he had given the right to become children of God. And that happens through the work of Jesus. And therefore, John. The writer of the gospel is carefully laying this out. Here was God's plan. Here was the announcement. John was sent, a voice crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way. Acknowledging sin. Repenting. Sorrowing over it. The Lamb of God comes. Maybe the one whom you trust. 
A man, yes. But a man who was before John because he was the Son of God. And here is a title that the writer of the Gospel, John, will use ten times in his Gospel, identifying Jesus as the second person of the Trinity who took on human nature that he might live amongst us. And yes, he is called the Son of Man in John's Gospel as well, 12 times. An identification with his people. But together, in the person of Jesus Christ, we have a Savior. We may know who he is. Why is that so important? Because we must trust in him for our salvation. And we must know whom we have believed. It is not some hopeful thinking. It is a confidence receiving what God has revealed. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who is the Son of God. And they come together in the person of Jesus Christ and we say, here is my salvation. Here is my hope, my confidence. Because God has come and is able to accomplish what I cannot. I cannot make up for my sin. I cannot pay for them. What do I have? But here is God coming, providing the Lamb to be sacrificed for my salvation. And we stand in one. And we rejoice at the testimony of John the Baptist. We rejoice at the testimony of the Holy Spirit. That we may read of this one who is the Savior. Who takes away the sin of the world. That we may come to him and be forgiven. May that be your hope, your confidence, what you know. As you consider who Jesus is, that you may trust in Him for everything in your life will be for your eternal soul. Amen. Let us pray. Father, there is simplicity in our text. How easily we can read over it and think, I know this already. Lord, may we stop and consider and meditate at what you accomplished and be astounded, be overwhelmed that the Son of God could become the Lamb of God. That he would say, I will take the sin of my people. I will be offered a sacrifice that they might be forgiven. Lord, we think of the eternal ramifications, the eternal consequences because of this, that we may have hope, that we may escape judgment, that we may anticipate the glory that will be ours in full measure, that we have now a foretaste of. Oh Lord, we pray for you to impress this upon our hearts, that we may rejoice in our Savior, in the Lamb of God, the Son of God, Jesus the Christ. Amen. In response, let us turn to hymn number 645, a hymn that reflects on the consideration of Jesus. Jesus, the very thought of thee. In 645, let's stand as we sing.
Jesus, the very thought of thee with sweetness fills my breast. But sweeter far thy face to see and in thy presence rest. For that is our hope and our confidence. Lord, have now received the benediction of your God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you, God's people, 